I've known everybody. <laughs> and I've lived all over the world. In this country, I lived in Louisiana and Alabama, Connecticut and Brooklyn, Mississippi, Manhattan, Long Island, Palm Springs, Kansas, and, and at a further remove, Moscow, Italy, France, and Switzerland. And I once went to Staten Island. <laughs> <laughs> It was like Australia. <laughs> and this is my apartment in the United Nations Plaza on New York's East River. And I've had Joanne and Johnny Carson and Robert Kennedy for neighbors. And, and we all have this, just this magnificent view. Just all looks out on the United Nations. And, and it's just lovely to sit here you know, with drinks <laughs> and the phonograph on just at twilight when all the lights of the city begin to come on. So, so, stick around. <laughs> <laughs> well, what to tell you, what to tell you. I collect, I like to collect, I collect stuff. You know, Paperweights. This was given to me years ago by Colette. It's Baccarat. It's now worth fifteen thousand dollars. Just and um, and books, 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 ever more, ever more books, and a number of plaster cats. And oh, please. <laughs> Inappropriate Victoriana. <laughs> I'm the decorator's despair. <laughs> Poor lady, such good taste. However, good taste is the death of art, you know, right? <laughs> anyway, I collect stuff like a magpie. However, I don't love it much once I've got it. I have very little sense of possession. If I've learned anything, it is that you can't ever really own anything. And I bet you're just sitting there waiting for me to say, especially people, right? Well, I guess we've all noticed how you can never, never own another person. But another person can own you. <laughs> it's a very strange equation. <laughs> Do you like my hat? I wear hats a lot now. The receding locks of the aging poet. The poet laureate of the lavatory wall. <laughs> well, this, that's what they're saying, anyway. At this particular moment in my life, I stand accused of obscene treachery and betrayal. Because three months ago, to sort of jolt myself out of a depression, I let Esquire publish a chapter from a novel that I've been working on for 20 years, and the novel is called Answered Prayers, and the title is from St. Teresa of Avila, and she wrote, more tears are shed over answered prayers than unanswered ones, and St. Teresa was one sharp little cookie cutter. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Answered Prayers is the book that, that I've been in training for. My whole life is, is going to be my vanity fair. <laughs> my remembrance of things past. You know, they say everybody's got one book in them. Well, hell, I've written lots of books, but basically I've always had this one book just to justify just everything, everything. And what's it about? You know? <laughs> Answered prayers is about them, the super rich, as seen through the eyes of an outsider who for various reasons has privileged access. It's about sexual license, an ethical squalor. Woo! <laughs> Camus once said, my God, I've only written a tenth of what I know, and they're already screaming. <laughs> I think I know what he meant. <laughs> All this brouhaha over that one little chapter, which is nothing, really, but a very truthful, and if I may say, witty account of a bunch of silly people sitting at a restaurant, dishing the dirt on each other. I used a couple of real names and certain attributes of some others, but my God, you'd think I'd kill the Lindbergh baby. 
listen, just listen to what Liz Smith said. You know Liz Smith? In the New York Magazine, Truman Capote, in hot water. Society sacred monsters are in a state of shock. Never have you heard such gnashing of teeth, such shouts of betrayal, as if I were Franklin Roosevelt, a traitor to my class. <laughs> which is hogwash. I'm not one of them. I'm an artist, and, and artists belong to no class, and people like that who cozy up to artists do so at their own risk. <laughs> Jimmy, hi, this is Mr. Capote. Listen, I'm going to put a recently orphaned poinsettia plant out the back door for anyone who wants to give it a good home. Jingle bells. All right, bye. <laughs> oh, God. It's horrid. Mm. Well, it is. Oh. If ever I would leave you. Secretary, Mrs. White had to go to the dentist and ask me to call you about a couple of inquiries. One's from this lady's literary society in Louisville, offering to almost double your fee. It's for the week of February 7th. Now, that would set a precedent. And Mrs. White said if you took this gig for that fee, she could maybe up your price on the whole circuit. Oh, that's wonderful. Listen, hon. When Irene gets back, ask her when Norman Mailer stabbed his wife how much his fee went up. <laughs> no, listen. <laughs> no, listen, it's television. I used to be famous because I wrote books. Now I'm famous for being famous. <laughs> Fame is only good for one thing. They'll cash your check in a small town. <laughs> now, where, where, was, where was I? Where was I? Oh, yes, the rich. And I don't count anyone who's really rich who cannot quickly summon up 50 million in hard currency. And I spent 20 years in the company of the big rich. I just flown everywhere in their jets, jets with marble loos and, and queen-size beds. Everything always so comfy. And their wonderful fetal food, you know, their little fresh-born vegetables. <laughs> the baby lamb that's been ripped from its mother's womb. <laughs> no, they eat well, <laughs> and they take great care of their bodies, and they never hit you up for a loan. <laughs> Speaking of taking care of your bodies, <laughs> oh, isn't it boring? <laughs> But the rich, the rich, most of them are pretty sad. Most of them would be totally lost without their money. You know, that's why it means so much to them. <laughs> why they're so fixated on the subject. You know? 